Welcome in everybody to this week's Sky Playmakers podcast and I'm very excited. This man needs no introduction whatsoever, you'll know him very well, especially if you're from Canterbury, joining us from Panasonic Club in Japan, my old mate Robbie Deans. Robbie, how are you buddy? Very good, thank you Marshy. Well I think without debate you're, you're quite easily one of the most successful rugby coaches that, that we've ever had, but when, when a lot of people look at seeing you now and, and what you've been doing recently, they forget that you used to play the game. And for you, obviously, that, that started with, with Canterbury uh, and, and your, your involvement there in that great Ranfurly Shield era. Uh, I picked something up in the notes somewhere that said when you were playing through that period that you had to move the fullback because Wayne Smith, the incumbent 10, was playing 10, so you had to adjust. But mate, it must have been a great period to be involved with Canterbury Rugby when you came in around that time. Oh, look, I, I feel totally spoiled, to be honest, uh, in terms of the timelines of my rugby career. Um, I think I've seen the best of, of everything. And um, at, at every stage, I thought it would be finite. You know, I didn't think it would last long, but I'm still in the game and just consider myself incredibly lucky to do what I've done and to have done what I've done. The experiences I've had uh, and part of the motivation for me staying in the game was to, to essentially replicate that for this for the next generations. Um, you're right, Canterbury back in that era, they, they had a strong traditional era, but uh, there was no NPC at that time, they were just traditional fixtures. You, you travel to North Island and play a few teams, three games in a week. A lot of fun, but different. Um, then they had an NPC, we were lucky, I think we won it in 83, and then... Uh, but prior to that, we were close to relegation. Uh, and then Alec Wiley and Doug Bruce came back and coached. They had sort of led that previous strong generation who had a shield era themselves. They came back and coached and influenced that uh, young group. And it was a good time to be in the game. You know, we, we became very close. Wives, families, and there's still a lot of strong friendships that, that last till today. And that's what we tried to replicate, you know, with you guys. Um, and... Uh, I see the same thing happening now, you know, and that, that there's a few players in our era that coached, there's a few players in your playing era that are now coaching, and the Crusaders have, have um, retained their soul, retained that, that pure motivation, and they've taken it to another level, you know, as every generation does. Um, so, yeah, man, I, I've, I had the best of, of everything. Seeing amateur, I was an amateur in my playing day, obviously. In fact, I got paid... $17.89 for a game of cricket once. <laughs> I didn't bat for the bowl that was washed out for Canterbury. And I didn't I didn't bank it because it would turn me into a professional and, and uh, I didn't want to compromise my status. <laughs> you were doing better than me because that $17 was, uh, I reckon, only, well, it was double of what I was getting, which was a Cobb & Co voucher for Southland. So you've done you've done quite well, I think, Deansy, you know, 10 years before me. Um, speaking of that era, you were involved in that epic Auckland Canterbury uh, Shield match. Um, mate, give us a bit of insight. What the hell was said in the changing rooms at half time in that? Was it was it Grizz basically stomping well, around booting chairs, or was it quite composed? Or you know what what was actually said? Uh, did the boys obviously believe yeah, they could get back? It's out? one of those moments. It's one of those moments in sport, and you've had a lot yourself that are surreal. Yeah. Where you, you just you gobsmacked. You think you know what just happened. Um, and that's the nature of Ranfield Shield rugby, the nature of Test rugby, the nature of World Cups. It just happens and it goes so fast. But yeah, the we didn't used to go into the changing sheds. It was on the on the field. We used to have oranges at halftime in that era, Marshy, which is completely the wrong thing to do. But we believed in it. So, but um, Alec came down for the halftime speech, and un, unbeknown to us, a bloke took a a swipe at him on the way down because he wasn't happy with the scoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> so he. Uh, it was a different half time from Alec because he didn't say a lot. It, normally he would say a bit and he'd get his finger out and be driven into a few chests and you'd never engage with eye contact with him because you'd be next. Um, but he basically picked up the ball and said, just get your hands on this. You can do the, You can do what they've done. Just get your hands on this and you'll be fine. And he stormed off and left us there and there's still a few <laughs> minutes to go. <laughs> But we followed his instructions and um, we got close to turning the game around. It was, yeah, it was a remarkable game. The one thing that I didn't know 
which has eluded me and we haven't been able to have a chat over a beer with it. So on Sky Sport Playmakers, we're going to have to d uh, delve into it. You went on the Cavaliers Tour. That sounds deep, mate. I'm the Cavaliers myself. Tour, 1986. Yep. How was that? Uh, well, like I said earlier, it was another of those uh, anomalies, really. It stands alone. Uh, it was, yeah, it was an uncomfortable time mm. in many ways. You know, there was mixed emotions uh, and it wasn't what, it wasn't what we aspired it to be. Um, it wasn't what I hoped it would be, having listened to the transistor back in the day uh, of the All Blacks playing in, in those series mm. and thinking that's that's the ultimate. Um, so when we got there, obviously, it, it, the context wasn't great. No, we didn't have um, unanimous support. We knew that. We, uh, and what sums it up, I think, probably get to give you an image. Uh, I played in the fourth uh, fixture. Mm -hmm. And I recall just before we ran out, I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror with the Cavaliers jersey on. And my, my emotions just sank. Wow. I just thought, this just, this isn't, this just isn't, right uh it's not our national team mm. you know but obviously to them it was to us it wasn't and you can't replicate that you can't replicate pulling on the fern uh so yeah you know look that's that's without even entering the the politics of it but uh yeah it was something that that we did um it's not something that we shout from the treetop um, it, we were hoping that it was, was going to be more than it was. Uh, but whether it impacted on change over time, who knows? The, the move into coaching uh, was through the NPC. And, um, you know, obviously you did club stuff and that, but the first big step was NPC with uh, Steve Hansen. How did you find that, moving into that environment? And you weren't long, you know, out, out of playing, uh, into coaching and being involved in, in, you know, coaching professionally nearly. Yeah, probably the best way to describe that was that was the first conscious decision, conscious choice yeah. to coach. I'd sort of always been coaching as a player um, within club. You know, we didn't, we're Glenmark, a very small club like where you came from, and uh, we never had enough for a full set of reserves, so everyone got to play. Um, and you'd coach so that you could receive the ball on the back line, you know? Um, <laughs> And, and it just became a, set, a rewarding thing to help others to, to, to enjoy the game. Um, so when I re retired in 1990, I was contacted to the Colts and then I did a school team. And, and so I was coaching long before um, 97 when, yeah, ultimately, courtesy of Donny Hayes badgering me, I rolled over and said, OK, I'll do it. Uh, Smithy moved on to, to coach the All Blacks, so you took over. Um, and we we uh, we were on a, a year where we'd won two titles. So again, like you were with the NPC, it was a pretty successful year, wasn't it? Um, where we managed to achieve the three peak. What were your memories of going, you know, from manager to coach, and, and then that responsibility of two titles taking over from Smithy? Did you find that tough, or because you'd been involved, pretty seamless? Uh, to be honest, pretty seamless because I was coaching NPC, as you know, which was, in that era was effectively the same team. There wasn't a lot of of outsiders coming in. Um, and I was involved in both campaigns, so I'd had consistent engagement with the, the personnel on and off the field. So it was pretty seamless. But yes, it's a new accountability. Yes, there was, you know, the expectation and that we had moments through that campaign. Mm. Um, but it's it was everything that I hoped it would be. You know, uh, you don't take on coaching... For, for the ease of it. You take it on for the challenge um, and for the, the stimulation, excitement and thrill of, of embracing that challenge with your people, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it was everything I hoped to be and that, that campaign was, yeah, it was tough, but we got there. And that was a remarkable achievement. First first win, I think, uh, prior to the Crusaders winning in, in uh Johannesburg, I think that was the first win offshore and there hadn't been one in between those two for, for a Super Rugby title, for a franchise to win away from home. 
went on successfully. Like you said, there were there were there were moments, but when you look at your coaching career that spanned that Crusaders uh, era that you were involved, five titles, uh, and um, you know really successful. If if you weren't winning finals, you were pretty much either in them or close to them. So, must have been incredibly gratifying. If you think back, Deansy, through that period from 2000 until when you finished in seven, was it? Nine. Eight. Eight. There you go. Uh, you switched off after you left, mate. <laughs> yeah, I did, didn't I? No, I was still watching, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, what, what game, if you were to think about it through all of that, really sticks in your mind as being your favourite? Yeah. <laughs> that is such a tough question because there's so many that you remember for different reasons, you know? Um, but, OK, I'll answer it for you. For me, probably... Um, 2002 Waratahs, Aye. and the reason I picked that one out is it was uh, probably the evolution point of us as a, as a team, as an organisation. Um, we we won those three titles back to back through the 2000. Then 2001, we we had a speed bump, courtesy of not adapting, and I blame myself a lot in terms of not personalising our load. And and evolving the way we went about what we did. And 2002 was a, a transition time. So Toddy had been a big part of the leadership, you know, a, a, a key pillar of the leadership. He left in 2001. And I recall yourself challenging the group actually in Hanma, <laughs> where yeah. we, we have a lot in pre season, we have a lot of di discussions about how we're going to go about we want, you know, what we want to do, why we want to do it, how yeah. we're going to go about it. And you challenged the group at the end of it all. You heard what was said. And as you know, we the key thing is that we bring these things to life. And you challenged the group. You said, yep, I've heard all you blokes, but which one of you is going to actually stand up? You know, who are going to stand up and fill that void that Blackhead has left? Mm. And it was a great challenge. Uh, it drew a response, as you tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's fixture at the end of that year to me was the first um, evidence of us collectively owning and functioning as a, as a collective instinct and collective leadership. It was, a, it was you know, one of those games where everything stuck. Mm. I think we were 63-0 at half time. It was very amusing entering the changing shed and, sit, and, and you're all sitting there looking at me like, so what are you going to say now? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, th I think I said, righto, let's start again. We might have to meet these blokes in the playoffs because they were number two on the table. Yep. And there's a possibility we'd have to meet them in the, in the final, uh, which didn't eventuate. That I think we mentally finished them off. They got beaten by the Brumbies and we ended up playing the Brumbies. But, um, yeah, it was just the, the ultimate expression of all the things that we'd aspired to do. And the critical one being player-led, player-owned, and um, yeah, just the ultimate expression of ownership of performance. How do you compare coaching super rugby to making the step up to international rugby? Now, obviously, the pressure completely changes. You know, you had your stint with the All Blacks. Um, what people probably don't know out there, it was a very successful stint, all bar one game, um, which you know, which was in my mind harsh, but. Was, you were still successful coach of the All Blacks, if you look at your, your record and your history, and then obviously on to Australia, one of the most successful coaches for Australia as well. So how did you find that adjustment, dealing with international players and, and being in that environment compared to uh, the, the, the sort of super rugby environment? Um, the biggest difference is time with your playing group. Um, and that pertains to the nation, obviously, in terms of what is allowed, what, you, what you're able to do. Uh, you know, you can build a program at franchise level. It's, it's harder at international level, particularly if you don't have alignment, mm -hmm. with, um, you know, which obviously New Zealand's worked very hard on that and, and, and achieved that over a period of time, which ultimately gave them the success that they were after. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, I enjoy that day-to-day -day interaction 
with players, with staff, with governance, building a program so that you can actually, you know, when you walk away, you leave something that's going to pass the test of time. Um, international has, as you alluded to, accountabilities that uh, they're a lot more uh, brutal, if you like. The scrutiny is more brutal uh, and and the judgment is more immediate. So you don't get necessarily get um, the chance to learn from mistakes. Um, but they're both rewarding. It was everything that I was ready for that that step. Mm. Um, and 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 I loved it. You know, it was a great challenge. Enjoyed it. Got some great memories. Um, ultimately, like to think that we helped to actually push New Zealand to another level as well. <laughs> Because uh, you know we were second in the world for three years running there, yeah. and New Zealand was number one, and ultimately got the job done in the World Cup. And um, uh, you know, while that that obviously wasn't my accountability at the time, I wanted one of either New Zealand or the Wallabies to win. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, you mate. <laughs> we probably... What was it like? Because you spent your time coaching Canterbury and coaching the Crusaders predominantly in New Zealand, you got to mix with the All Blacks, um, but, but ultimately you, 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 know, you obviously didn't coach any other province or, or any other franchise. So what was it like all of a sudden having to coach against familiar faces like Crusaders you'd coach, like for example, Richie McCaw and preparing a game thinking, right, how are we gonna get rid of this bloke at the breakdown and negate his strengths? Was that kind of weird to have to sort of try and break that down or you, you just liked it as a challenge? Like I remember when he came along for his first training run at Canterbury and honestly, I, we, I had to pull the team aside because he's in the opposition. I said, boys, this young fluffy haired little so-and-so, if someone doesn't clean him out and give him a good buddy, forearm across the nose, he's, he's completely ruined our training run, which he was. He was in there and he's slowing the ball down. He wasn't sniffling it. And we, this is, a, you know, so for you to have those players all of a sudden there's the opposition. It must be quite strange because you would never have had it right through your time in New Zealand. No, you do You do sometimes coach against players that you've coached through super, the super system, but yep. you're right. To coach, to coach against that that um, that group of Crusaders who were the nucleus of the All Blacks, you know, particularly in leadership roles, it, it, that's what worried me most prior to considering the role, contemplating the role, whether I, sh you know, whether I should take it on. I took counsel from people, guys like John Wright, who had uh, coached India against New Zealand, people that I knew well, respected their opinions. and But ultimately, yes, until you get to the ground on the day and you see the haka and people who you know intimately and just won a super title with two weeks prior <laughs> are running out on the other side, you just don't quite know. But I can report it was fantastic. Yeah, it was. It, you know, it's it's a test match. Everyone's being tested, um, and the critical thing in this game, no matter what level you're involved in, the critical thing is respect. Respecting your opposition, respecting the people you play with, respecting the administrators, the referees. Respect is everything. Mm. It's only when you don't respect. When you fail to respect one element, that's when you get bitten. Yeah, it was easy to respect the All Blacks. Yeah, yeah. I knew them all intimately. <laughs> I knew how good they were, so it, it was respect. It, it, it was easy to respect them, but it was even easier to to love the occasion. But because the, it's the occasion that we chase. But didn't it frustrate? It must have frustrated you when you just get like a freak, like someone like Dan Carter, who you're so used to. Oh. Have, to have been doing something for you, for the Crusaders, and you've got this test match in the bag for that. Aussie, and he just goes and does this thing, and you go, how the hell were we supposed to defend that? Like, you know what? Yeah. It must be like, for yeah. God's I've, sakes. I've, you know, I've had the benefit of that, I guess, over time. But, yeah, of course. You know, yeah. We lost games courtesy of things that some of those amazing individuals did. Mm. But I was happy for them and, and what they're doing. You know, I've, had, I've, I've had a a piece of that, I've contributed to that, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud to see what all you guys are going on to do in life, you know? Yeah. That's what it's all about. 
it's a, we're just facilitators as coaches. And, and to see those guys do what they do, the way they do it, just it makes you proud to think that you've contributed in some way. But um, it's, it may also makes you proud to still be involved, you know, mm. uh, and, and make a difference to, to people. That's what it's all about. Yeah. But, yes, there's, look, one thing I will concede, mate, is where it was hardest was, you know, we had personal relationships. And obviously because of the context and that, that first test match, which we actually won in Sydney by record score, it was awkward afterwards, you know, and, and obviously I, I don't want to make them feel awkward. So I, I bumped into Dan coming back from the press conference and it's just awkward. And he conceded that in, in some of his dialogue mm. since where it does impact on, on your relationships. They're not as close as they were, um, but, you know, hopefully... I consciously, when Dan finished playing international, he was in France, I consciously went and caught up with him and to, to reconnect, you know, yeah. uh, because some of those those more personal elements are sacrificed. You're right. You obviously went through that process internationally, Deansy, and um, then decided to head off, much to my surprise, to be perfectly honest, because if I was putting my very hard-earned dollars on it, I would have thought that you might have gravitated towards France, <laughs> given that... Uh, you've spent a bit of time over there before as a player way back in the day and Penny speaks pretty much fluent French, which you don't. Um, but you ended up in Japan. Um, so what sort of prompted the move to go there rather than Europe? I mean, we thought, probably in our minds, we thought we'd ultimately end up in France as well, particularly with our history and Penny's French skills. But um, we've just loved it. You know, we love the people, we love the game. It's a, it's a positive game here. It's a fast game. And it's a, it's a developing game. And you've seen that through the performances of the Brave Blossoms mm -hmm. at World Cups. Um, and there's enough going on. We're relocating. We've redeveloped the stadium. We've got a, a new training facility with a hotel that looks out over it, mate. So there's room there when you're ready. Very good. Um, Do your boat fit on the moat or no? It's a little bit, a little bit small. There, there are actually boatable rivers here, but the red tape would be a nightmare, mate. So <laughs> particularly with your and my history. So what, what are your thoughts on the state of our game globally at the moment all this talk about a global season um you know being i guess a lot more accommodating to the likes of japan and the pacific islands getting them more test matches um obviously there's a lot of challenges to getting rugby you know in the right space where do you think we are health wise at the moment yeah. <laughs> Jeez, how long have you got <laughs> <laughs> I know you know <laughs> Barbarians rugby is really healthy, that's for sure, no doubt about that, but um, yeah. you've enjoyed coaching they, them. But... They manage their curfews, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I know. Yeah, well, that's what happens sometimes when people can't look after themselves, can they? But, yeah, I guess yeah, it's just so, a big, it's, a, it's, it's topical at the moment, DNZ, isn't it? You know, people have got their opinions. Absolutely, and there needs to be a lot of thought going on behind the scenes in governance, and, and there is, I know there is. Mm. Um, and there's going to be some decisions that have to be made that are not going to be universally popular, but they have to be made. Mm. And, and you know, as we talked about right at the start, as long as they come from the right place of motivation and me meaning in terms of impact, then the game, the opportunities in the game are enormous. I mean, there's a queue, as we've just witnessed in New Zealand, there's a queue of private investment that are interested and want to get their hands on the game. It's managing that dynamic of governance. Um, the game's only been professional for 25 years. And, you know, you think back to the first few years where, where in the amateur era we were racing sardines in terms yeah. of physique. There's, in the first three or four years, the average body weight went up by 15 kilograms. And... Now it's gone further, and there's challenges that are coming with that that are going to have to be addressed. Mm. And, and the impact of those on the pathway is going to have to be addressed, and we've got to be catering for both ends. If you don't cater for your factory, your, your domestic game in each instance, each nation, then it'll impact on the future. It, it'll change the game over time. Um, so both ends have to be catered for. That's all I would say. That's the short version. Thank you so much for joining us. You still sound young, enthusiastic, um, passionate for the game. Um, I'm sure you're going to 
keep coaching teams as long as you can, keep uh, giving players opportunities like you did with those young Crusaders way back in the day. And uh, we wish you, Penny, your family, all the very best for the future and really appreciate your time, mate. Thank you, Marshy.